I know that we've got a lot of dietitians in the house for my dietitians. Woo! All right, but what about uh, journalists? Where are my journalists at? You sounded a lot less excited than the dietitians. <laughs> You've just been like hiding all day, like, oh, this is for the dietitians. Well, I'm calling you out right now because my primary life right now um, is I work as a speaker and a writer, and I wrote this book. It's out with Simon & Schuster. Um, and if you're a writer, if you're a journalist, usually when you go out to a party, a wedding, whatever, people are like, well, what are you working on? And so you give, yeah, everybody knows, everyone just nodded. And so you give a little synopsis of what you're working on. So when I spent, was working on um, this book, Eight Flavors, I would talk about that I'm working on this book that tries to define American food through its most prominent flavors. And it uses those ingredients to talk about American history and also about Americans. A lot of my work focuses on the cultural aspects of food. And in the um, domain of this book, I look very specifically at um, what makes an American and really broadening that identity of American from someone who looks like me to someone who, well, can be many different colors, backgrounds, and ethnicities and put many different foods on their plates. So I'm trying to go from a very, uh, very narrow definition to a broad one. This is going to be relevant to us. So the follow-up question after I pitch the idea of the book is, well, what are the eight flavors? And I'm like, OK, I gotcha. In chronological order to when they came into the American kitchen, they are black pepper, vanilla, chili powder, curry powder, soy sauce, garlic, MSG. And I never make it to the ninth one because they go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> the ninth one is sriracha, by the way. They say, and so they're like, okay, okay, okay. Maybe I've got those other ingredients in my pantry, but I do not have MSG in my pantry. And I say, don't you? <laughs> do you own any processed anything? Do you have a can of something? And without that, do you have anything that's savory in your home? Do you have a wedge of Parmesan cheese? Because if you have any of those things, you have MSG in your home. Well, I thought MSG was bad for you. And I was like, OK, well, here's, here's why it's not, which is basically everything you've heard up until this point, right, in this day of our talks. But then the third and final question is one that is probably on your minds right now. So if MSG isn't bad for us, then why do we all think it is? So I'm here to give you the cultural context for that how we became a culture that is so afraid of MSG, we have to have an entire two-day conference about it <laughs> to convince you it's fine. And then the bigger related question is this. Why do Americans fear MSG but love umami? Because that uh, one of the charts that Lisa showed I really resonated with me when they were talking to dietitians and say, well, how do you feel about umami? And they're like, oh, it's great. 46% of me says it's great. And then two questions later, they say, well, how do you feel about MSG? Oh, it's awful. It's horrific. CRS, it's terrible for you. 68% of us think it's terrible. When we're literally talking about the same thing, but with two different names. So part of what I want to do is a little bit of review from this morning. Again, there's a quiz at the end of the day. And it's going to be after you have those cocktails, too. So <laughs> study up. So we're very familiar with Dr. Kakune Akita. He is the Japanese chemist who really discovered, quantified, and named umami. And he did that because he actually went to Europe. He went to Germany, and he was tasting foods like aged cheese and tomatoes that he had not experienced before and said, what is this flavor? It's not sweet, sour, salty, or bitter, so what is it? And then when he came home, he recognized that same flavor in a food that is classic Japanese cuisine, which is kombu dashi. Um, kombu dashi, as we've covered already, is made from kelp, kelp harvested from the ocean. There it is historically being harvested. It's been used within Japanese culture for thousands of years because Japan is traditionally um, a vegetarian country. Buddhism, Shintoism, vegetarian is at the center of it, but also it's a very mountainous country with very little pasture land. So historically, there was not a lot of meat being eaten, especially by average Joes like me and you. The reason that this kelp was so valued when it was turned into a broth, kombu is kelp, dashi is broth, is because it tasted extremely savory, extremely meaty, without there being meat in it. 
one of the differences I think that you experienced in the vegetable stock with vegetable stock plus MSG is that it went from being, well, tasting like carrots to tasting richer and meatier as though it maybe had been made with chicken. So um, Dr. Akita recognized this taste within kombu dashi, which is um, really the backbone of Japanese cuisine. And he took this broth, which was also cheap to work with, which was great as a, as a beginning biochemist, and he reduced it down until it crystallized into a salt. And then he analyzed the salt, which by the way, you can do at home, a fun and tasty experiment. The recipe and how to do it is in my book too. Um, and he looked at what the salt was made up of. And the two primary components that were responsible for its flavor were glutamic acid, free glutamate, and salt. Because after all, this all comes from the ocean. So each frond of kelp was covered in salt. And when you have glutamic acid and salt in a crystallized form, it is called, I, I heard a, a quiet whisper, but it came from the scientist, so it doesn't count. It's all right, I'm gonna tell you. Salt plus glutamic acid is monosodium glutamate, okay? That's it. So we, we've been learning about glutamic acid and how it tastes savory. Well, it really tastes savory when it's hanging out with salt. And that's salt, glutamic acid and salt, that's an ionic bond. And those bonds are really easy to pull apart and put back together. Here in this picture, they're together. But then when I take this and I put it in my mouth with my spit, that bond releases and you're back to salt and free glutamate separate again. So separate or together, it's the same thing. So when something becomes a crystal, it's not somehow more dangerous for you than when it's in a liquid form. It's just like sea salt. When it's in the ocean, it's a liquid. When it crystallizes and you put it on your fancy finishing dish at a restaurant, it's salt. One or the other isn't more or less good or bad for you. So he crystallizes um, MSG essentially 1907 from kombu dashi. This is the start of what will become the Ajinomoto Corporation um, who they originally made iodine, which also came from kelp. So it was Kakuni Akita that partnered with them and began manufacturing this commercially. What I find sort of fascinating about this moment is that at this time period, the, begin the turn of the 20th century, a lot of new products were coming on the market that people didn't know what they were or how to use them. A great example from this country is Jell-O. Jell-O sold terribly until, I think it was 1904, when the first Jell-O cookbook came out. And it taught people how to use it. It was actually in some ways too simple for housewives at that time. You didn't understand the concept of just adding water to something when previously you had been rendering uh, calves hooves for hours to make Jell-O. There was a disconnect. So what I find fascinating is to get people to use this, um, Ajinomoto, you saw some photos from um, my colleague, Dr. San, um, San's images earlier from his presentation. Um, to appeal to housewives, one of their kind of amazing ideas was they wanted MSG to look like cosmetics. So that's what they're selling here, perfume bottles and like powder bottles of MSG. So this predates the shaker and it was this whole idea of like, well, if we're gonna sell it to women, we should make it look pretty. The slightly more effective way of selling that, as my colleague also mentioned, was through cooking schools. So in Japan, when you graduated from cooking school, because turn of the 20th century, women started going to college in large numbers for the first times, and one of the socially acceptable degrees that they could get was in nutrition. Um, and the whole idea of vitamins and minerals and calories, that was all really new at the turn of the 20th century. So Ajinomoto kind of partnered with that and also taught their students how to use this. And that's how by 1930, there is essentially a shaker on the dinner table of every single Japanese home. So how does it come to America? It was covered a little bit briefly later, but it essentially comes not through the Japanese population, but through the Chinese population. That's why in this country, we associate MSG with Chinese food more than we do Japanese food. Because Chinese immigrants have been, come, been coming here longer, further back, really since the 1840s in big numbers, and it came here in much greater numbers than Japanese immigrants. So it came into America through Japanese chefs. Um, by the way, this is a photo of Doyer Street, which is like my favorite street in Manhattan. Still is all crazy crooked like this. And if you've ever been to Nomua Tea Parlor, which is one of the oldest Chinese restaurants in the country, that is in the building that's marked uh, the Mandarin Tea Garden. So you're looking right at it. And then like the post office is where this building is over here. And most of the buildings are the same. They just have different fronts on them. I love that street, as you can tell. 
So it comes through the Chinese population. Um, this is the first cookbook published in America written by a Chinese man really talking about authentic Chinese cuisine for an American audience. So it is written in, in English, although there are many Cantonese characters included in the text. And nearly every single recipe includes what the author calls gourmet powder. Um, that, in this case, is right down here. And gourmet powder is a literal translation of the Cantonese word for monosodium glutamate. So um, Dr. San talked a little bit about how it went from Japan to Taiwan and then into the mainland. And um, again, China, very heavily Buddhist country, meaning then a very heavily um, vegetarian country, particularly in the 19th century. So even the different brands of MSG that were for sale in China would often invoke that religious connection. One of the brands was called Buddha's Hand. So it gets popular again because it's very cheap and it makes something taste meaty, which is both important for a religion, but also because um, you maybe just couldn't afford meat in your food either. Um, the author of this book calls this gourmet powder, a monosodium glutamate, one of the five Chinese staples needed to make authentic Chinese cooking. So he is really tying it into Chinese culture and presenting that to American culture as well. I found this bottle in Dead Horse Bay. Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I say Dead Horse Bay? Not a, well, you've got something to do for the rest of your weekend. There is a beach way, way out in Queens, I think. It's like kind of near JFK. Um, it is in the um, national park that's out there, the National Recreation Area. And at the turn of the 20th century, it was a landfill. It was capped in the 1940s, and what's happening now is that since essentially it was built on an island, the ocean is coming along and it is eroding away all of the beach and exposing 100-year-old garbage. So when you're a weird history person like I am, you do, you do something fun, like go to a beach that's filled with broken glass on your afternoon. And it's the only national park where you can take something out of and nobody cares because it is actual garbage. What survives there? I know this is a turn you did not expect. Me neither, because look at this bottle. This bottle is from the late 1930s or early 1940s. A friend of mine literally pulled it out of the ocean in Dead Horse Bay, and it is Weiler's Meat Tenderizer with MSG. And this was a, a mind-blowing moment for me, because you are not going to see this packaging in grocery stores today, are you? You're going to see quite the opposite, something that says no MSG. So this made me realize that there was a point in time when we were not scared of MSG. Not only not scared of it, but having it in your product was considered a plus, a positive. So what's going on here? This bottle is from the same time as Henry Lowe is publishing his book. We're seeing both Ajinomoto and their American competitors accent releasing products in the United States. And they want to make it as common in American houses as it was in Japanese houses, a shaker on every single table. It didn't quite work out that way. Um, although some Americans cook with it, and you do see it appear in recipes occasionally in 1950s cookbooks, the main consumer of monosodium glutamate in this country to this day is American processed foods. So I think one of the things that almost unfortunately MSG does best is to make really terrible food taste really good. You can make something that is cheap, that is basically em empty of nutritive value, um, that is just bad for you in every single way, and put some MSG in it, and it tastes delicious. Which, Dr. Akita is probably rolling over in his grave, because you may have picked up on earlier today, he designed this to make healthy food taste better. And instead, in America, we use it to make terrible food taste better. So the number one consumer by millions of pounds of monosodium glutamate since the 1950s is American processed food, companies like Kraft and Campbell's. Um, and this is where we start to get the association in America that MSG is bad for you because it's hanging out with foods that are bad for you. But in and of itself, it is simply a tool like salt, which we know is not only not necessarily bad for you, we need it to be alive as humans. But too much salt, as is in a lot of processed food, is bad for you. Sugar tastes great. We love it. Had myself a pecan roll on the break. Too much sugar we know is bad for you. So like any of these basic ingredients, MSG can be the same thing. You use, it should be used as an ingredient, but it has sodium in it. So too much can be bad for you. And that's what we're seeing going on in processed food. 
Then as we move into the 60s, we're seeing a real fear of science. So in Dr. Akita's day, science was worshipped. You know, it was new, it was incredible, it was amazing. Science was treated as wonderful. But then in the 1940s during World War II, America introduced nuclear warfare. And that's not really wonderful. That was frightening and scary. Not only that, but we're seeing um, Silent Spring comes out in, forgive me on my dates, 62 or 64. Um, that's looking at a really popular pesticide that it turns out is poisoning our water system, is killing the bald eagle population. This book really resonated with people and began to shake our trust of um, science and what science was producing. Then there was thalidomide. Now the FDA did not approve thalidomide, thank goodness, but it was legal in Europe and Australia, and that meant that there were several thousands of children born with severe birth defects um, on a drug that was not tested well enough and was passed in their countries. That's also 50s and 60s. And then it starts happening in food by the 1960s as well. So there's cyclamate. All of these alternative sugars are being investigated as essentially cancer causing. And cyclamate, one alternative sugar, is still banned in America to this day. One should take that with a huge grain of, let's say, salt because this research was funded by the sugar industry. So it was in their best interest to find alternate sugars to be, well, dangerous. So now this gets a lot of press. Um, aspartame was banned for a while too. Cyclamate is still banned in America, although it's not in other countries. And so what then turns the lens to monosodium glutamate? Well, it's this letter that you keep hearing about. It's been referenced offhand a couple of times, a letter by um, Dr. Ho Kwok, Homan Kwok, and it was written to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1968. It was a letter to the editor. And the letter to the editor was titled Chinese Restaurant Syndrome. I'm gonna to read to you, because I'm sure most of you haven't heard this letter, what he actually wrote. I'm gonna to read to you an excerpt. For several years since I've been in this country, I've experienced a strange syndrome whenever I've eaten out in a Chinese restaurant, especially one that served Northern Chinese food. I think that's such an interesting knock of like Northern Chinese food, all right, whatever. The most prominent symptoms are numbness in the back of the neck, gradually radiating to both arms and the back, general weakness and palpitation. After some discussion, my colleagues and I first speculated that it might be caused by some ingredient in the soy sauce, to which quite a few people are allergic. Some have suggested that these symptoms may be caused by cooking wine, which is used generously in most Chinese restaurants. Others have suggested that it may be caused by the monosodium glutamate seasoning used to a great extent for seasoning in Chinese restaurants. Another alternative is that the high sodium content of the food causes thirst, which should also be due to the high sodium content. So he lists soy sauce, wine, MSG, and sodium as possibilities. And basically says that my, look, I, my hospital doesn't have the funds to research this. Can someone take up the torch and look into what might be causing these symptoms when I go out to eat Chinese food? So somebody did. And um, the, these were scientists Bick and Schoenberg and they did the first major study of monosodium glutamate in 1969. MSG will become the most heavily studied food additive in the next 30 years, but this is the first. Um, and what they find is they feed um, about 30 people who say that they have an MSG sensitivity, a bowl of uh, beef broth with MSG in it. So we, this was touched on a little bit earlier too, but if there is any moment when monosodium glutamate might make you feel ill, is this, it's if you drink a big hot bowl of it on an empty stomach. L much like actually when you start a meal with wonton soup. So you've got all of this sodium going into your body and you've got nothing else in your stomach. And we're also testing a group of people who came in saying that they had an MSG sensitivity. Not only that, but the other troubling thing about this study is that Bick and Schoenberg didn't test to see which ingredient might cause illness after eating Chinese takeout food. They tested to show how much MSG you had to ingest to cause those symptoms. There's a lot of scientists in this room. We call that bias. If someone is coming into a study saying, yes, I am sensitive to MSG, if we're not looking to see if MSG does or does not cause symptoms, but instead are testing to see at what amounts it causes symptoms, that's not great science, period. 
Not only that, these people are coming in on an empty stomach, and like, much like sugar or salt, this is not meant to be consumed on its own. It should be used as an additive, as a flavor enhancer. However, this study gets a lot of press, and so it all kind of seals the deal. MSG causes Chinese restaurant syndrome, which now also becomes the official name of this syndrome. And if that's not racist, I'm not sure what is. To essentially blame an entire immigrant culture for an illness, it implies ignorance of, that, um, of the people within those culture. It implies that those immigrants are intentionally or unintentionally poisoning, quote, Americans. And to have that be the official name is really shameful because frankly, again, the biggest consumers of MSG are American processed foods and no one has called it Dorito syndrome, right? <laughs> or Kraft mac and cheese syndrome. So that is pretty, pretty upsetting on its own. Now the interesting part to me about Chinese restaurant syndrome in the, in the beginning is that people treated it not as something to be afraid of, but as a, essentially a hangover. You know, if you're gonna go out and drink, there's a chance you might not feel well afterwards. We know that, but we don't see the same fear of alcohol as we do of monosodium glutamate, despite it being a chemical that is actually poisoning us. It's a fun poison, but it is a poison nonetheless. That's how drinking works. Think about that during cocktail hour. Hashtag roll the mommy forum. <laughs> so CRS is treated like a hangover in the 70s. Um, in 1968, the New York Times did a study and talked to a lot of Chinese restaurant owners and people who went to eat in these restaurants. And um, they talked to a guy in the Bronx who said that he had had these symptoms um, three or four times when he went to his favorite Chinese restaurant, which I think is a hilarious quote because despite having CRS three or four times, it, notice it is his favorite Chinese restaurant. He keeps going back. He really doesn't care. And then this is my favorite story that I dug up. Um, it's from 1972, and it's about actor Lorne Green, the star of Bonanza. And he had um, a bout of C CRS. And here's what he had to say about it. This is an actual quote. I had a light breakfast that day and practically nothing for lunch, and my wife and I went out to a Chinese restaurant for dinner. And the food was de-goddamn-licious. <laughs> Lauren Green, not me. I'm not up here swearing. Shrimp, beef, fried and sizzled, and like an idiot, I put some more soy sauce on the rice, and that stuff is filled with monosodium glutamate. Green collapsed as he was leaving the restaurant, but recovered fully and lived to eat Chinese food another day. So it was almost treated like a, a comic piece, that this is something that might happen to you, but it's not gonna stop you from eating Chinese food. So, all right, we've kind of turned the corner to people thinking that MSG causes these really mysterious symptoms, which are really, really sort of wide um, in their symptoms. And I should even say that um, I'm a migrainer, I have get severe migraines, and before I sat down to do the research for this book, I was blaming poor MSG for my migraines too, right? So I have turned around 180 after I started really looking at these next few studies. Because we started with Schoenberg and Bick. Sorry, should have thrown that slide in there. Now we're gonna get to John Olney. It's with Olney that things really take an insidious turn. So when Olney did his study, yeah, you all got your PubMed you know, per subscriptions, you get online, you, you, you look these studies up. I like that you're taking photos, you do get the slides afterwards. But yeah, all of these studies are still online, so you can actually get on and look at their scientific method. So what Olney does in his study is he doesn't do it on humans, he, do it, he does it on um, lab, lab mice. And he begins injecting these lab mice with MSG um, solutions at essentially different percentages. Um, and after you stick a, mice full, a needle full of MSG, it gets fat and dies. So this study came out and the press hooked into it and um, it was really widely reported. And actually one of the people who championing the study was Ralph Nader, yes, the Ralph Nader. He was good on seatbelts. This wasn't like one of his greatest hits here. And the critics of this study said, this isn't how people eat MSG. I hope to God none of you are out there mainlining MSG into your veins. Maybe you will after today because you're so excited about it, but don't because according to studies, you'll get fat and die if you're a rat. This has no bearing on the human consumption of MSG and the quantities that were being used in the study were far beyond the daily consumption of not only an American, but someone who lives in a country that is using MSG quite a bit more than we do. And I suppose as a digression, one of my favorite quotes about this um, is, if MSG is bad for you, then why doesn't all of Asia have a headache? It's just us, just America that's doing this. 
So this is a really big study. It gets a lot of press. Nader and Olney are um, going to the FDA and asking them to take this off the gender recognized as safe list. And we've got a bunch of fat dead mice who have been injected with MSG, which is fun for nobody, honestly. And it's in this, the study comes out in 1977, and then it's after this that you start seeing these no MSG signs appearing on Chinese restaurants. And there are some really heartbreaking um, interviews with people who are running these restaurants, saying that they were genuinely afraid for their well-being because people would attack them so viciously for putting MSG in their food. As a matter of fact, David Chang has talked about the exact same thing happening at Momofuku, that people come in irate and screaming because the food has MSG in it. And this really breaks my heart, too, because this is an entire culture coming to this country and changing the way that they're eating out of shame. And I've heard stories from my friends about the fact that the MSG shaker was taken off their table because they didn't want Americans to see that they were eating that way. And I think that that's really, really tragic. So it's been taking a long time to change. But the first really positive study comes from Tarasoff and Kelly. This is done in Australia. There's been a big break in studies since the only study in 1977. And this is the first study, this is really the one you want to look up because they lay down some sick burns in their, <laughs> even in their abstract here, um, that basically they point out that all of the problems with every previous study is bias. Not only in terms that they're selecting test subjects that already say, yes, I have an MSG sensitivity, but you can taste MSG. We just did that taste test. If you were given two cups, the vegetable stock without MSG and the vegetable stock with MSG, would you be able to tell in a blind taste touch which one was which? That's going to affect your bias, right? So if you know you're ingesting MSG, that throws off the placebo effect. You can't be neutral and, and say, oh, you know you're eating MSG. So if you already think you're sensitive, you're going to list those symptoms. So they have a super simple solution. Instead of giving people broth flavored with MSG, they give people tablets of MSG. And not only that, but they treat this study the same way people would actually consume monosodium glutamate in that they feed them. They give them um, granola bars, or excuse me, they're actually muesli bars. And also, to me, hilariously in the study, um, they list which, <laughs> which ones they gave them. Um, it's apricot and coconut, tropical fruits, three fruits, black currant, apple, or peppermint chocolate chip, if you were wondering, and also a glass of milk. And some of the recipients of the study ate after the MSG pill, and some of them ate before. And their results is that people reacted to MSG as much as they did the placebo. Both were about 15% of participants said that they were having um, CRS effects after eating the placebo or after eating monosodium glutamate. So they concluded the present study led to the conclusion that Chinese restaurant syndrome is an anecdote applied to a variety of postprandial illnesses. Rigorous and realistic scientific evidence linking the syndrome to MSG could not be found. And I think they make a really great point in that statement too, in that when you're eating food from a culture as complex as Chinese food, there are so many allergens in there, right? You as dietitians know, there is shellfish, there is soy, there are so many other things that people are legitimately allergic to. And all of those food allergies, when it came to eating out at Chinese restaurants, was getting lumped in and blamed on MSG. That's the bottom line to it. And it was getting lumped in and blamed on MSG within the context of Chinese food, but not at all talked about within the context of American processed food. So there is not only a little sprinkling of MSG in here, but a big dose of xenophobia that is affecting these decisions. And it's something we see to this very day. Things are starting to change too with the, the official discovery of the fifth taste of umami. And this is where we get this idea of MSG versus umami. So MSG, bad for you. Umami, oh well, you can have all these products. You've got umami taste number five. You've got umami bombs. You've got umami burger. This is a word that's used very, very liberally. Compared to the no MSG signs, we've got high-end products and restaurants slapping umami all over their signs, their advertisements, their menus. We're talking about the same thing. Sodium and glutamate, whether it's in your umami burger with your sun-dried tomato sauce and your Parmesan cheese and your portobello mushroom with a little salt on it, or whether it's a sprinkling of MSG, is chemically the exact same thing. 
This is more complex because it's got those tomatoes in there. It's got the Parmesan. It's got all of these other chemical compounds that are adding other flavor. And MSG, we can even look at it as the shortcut to getting there. But chemically, again, it's not different for you, and neither one is more or less dangerous. I mean, there's some other health problems, honestly, if you're eating that burger. <laughs> so, and, and it's, that isn't just limited to sort of like this, I would say, middle end food. Um, chefs, Le Bernardin, Per Se, and Jean Georges all use kombu dashi in their cooking to add rich umami flavor to their dishes. But they're calling it umami and they're labeling it as kombu dashi. They're not saying this tastes good because it's full of MSG, right? So we've got this high end that's sticking to the word umami, but now there is sort of a coterie of chefs that are fighting back. Um, and probably unsurprisingly, most of these chefs come from Asian families. Because if you grew up Asian and American, MSG wasn't a bad thing. There was often, I like that, I was like, mm -mm, no, it was on your grandmother's kitchen table, right? She put it in her dumplings. It's only us, the Americans, that were changing those recipes. So as these brief little bit of immigration history, we mentioned the Exclusion Act of 1882 today that prevented Chinese immigration that was eventually extended to include all of Asia. And by the way, that law, which started in 1882, is not lifted until 1965. We've got a long history of xenophobia and racism in this country that we really need to get working on, people. That's your other agenda for today. <laughs> After 1965, we see a huge wave of immigrants come from China, from Korea, from all over East and Southeast Asia. Um, and now, and they came here and they have kids. So what we're also seeing now in 2018 is the first generation of kids who are born to immigrant parents who came from Asia, but are raised here in this country. And that generation is often the translator. They've got a foot in their parents' world and a foot in being full-on Americans. And these are the chefs that are saying, you're wrong. Danny Bowian, for example, um, he's the chef, owner, restaurateur of Mission Chinese. Mission Chinese out in San Francisco, they have MSG shakers on their tables, just like at grandma's house, just like back in Japan, just like in Korea, right there alongside the salt and the pepper. And they're proud of it. And they really call out this idea of how a fear of MSG is connected to, to xenophobia. A lot of um, other chefs will talk about how they use MSG in their own cooking. Oh yeah, dash there, sprinkle there, it's really good. Oh, but I would never use it in my restaurant, which I think is also part of the problem. Well, if it's good enough for you, because it's, they're um, kowtowing to that public fear. Someone who is really not, though, is David Chang. There he is actually holding a giant tin of monosodium glutamate, not the Ajinomoto brand, sorry to the sponsors here today. Um, this is the Chinese brand that Dr. San was talking about earlier. Um, and although, well, I mean, I can't say that. I, I was gonna say, although he doesn't use granulated MSG in his restaurant, that's actually not true. One of the things he's famous for is using Kewpie mayonnaise, which is a mayonnaise brand from Japan, so you're familiar with it. It's just mayonnaise, but it's the best tasting mayonnaise you've ever had because it also has MSG in it, bottom line. So he will use products and ingredients and his whole R&D department that we were talking about earlier about making miso, like his whole business right now is focused on how to create delicious things that are full of glutamate and salt, which no matter what form it's in is MSG. So he is definitely the most outspoken chef saying this is baloney, this is based on a fear of other countries, and it's time to change that because frankly, America is changing. And I think more than anything, we're gonna see a big sea change coming before too long because the makeup of who we are as a country is changing. No matter how many walls we build, no matter how much griping we do, the country is gonna change from people who look like me to people who don't. White people will be a minority here within 50 years. More and more people are coming from Central and South America, which we haven't talked about a lot today, but is another huge consumer of mato sodium glutamate, but down there it's called aji no moto. <laughs> Thank you. And your grandmother uses it, I'm sure, with chicken. Your mother, yes. And of course, we're seeing this enormous immigration post-1965 from Asia, too. That is America. That will become the new America, not pilgrims and Puritans in New England. That is going to be the America of the future. And so I hope that if nothing else, just time is going to change this prejudice because the prejudice doesn't come from any real fear or any real science behind fearing sodium and glutamate together. The prejudice really is a deep down fear of people who are different than us. If you wanna read more about that, you should check out my book, 
If you like the words that came out of my mouth, you'll probably like the ones that I wrote down too. And I talk about these stories with, with seven other flavors as well. That also is my social media and you're welcome to ask me any questions. But we have six minutes. So if you have any questions right now, I'd be happy to entertain them. Do you have any questions, Andrew? I have a thousand questions for you, Sarah. Let's hear it. Um, I love the specific way that you sort of laid things out Thank for you. us. You know, when, when it comes to Chinese food, that's, and it's history in America. I know that history, mm. um, and I know about that experience, but we've also marginalized so many other people in America. Um, we, we, love, we love their food as a culture. We inhale right. the food of other peoples with our mouths first. And th the people we leave be behind for a while, and we've done it with Italian immigrants and German immigrants and Jewish immigrants, it's, just the, it's the story of our country. And I was wondering if you saw things in, in your research and in the way that the stories started to turn around and the way people are um, getting empowered over certain ingredients mm -hmm. like MSG and it's helping to really define a new generation of Chinese American chefs mm -hmm. or Korean American chefs or Japanese American chefs. Mm -hmm. If you see some hopeful trends uh, for the future and how we might integrate other peoples and their ideas and ultimately them mm -hmm. in this country. I think that the number one key to acceptance is time. I've often wondered on a scale how long it takes an idea or a person to become American. And I realize that it's also time plus at the moment appearance because the idea that we can talk about Chinese people and Chinese food and not associate that with American culture despite the fact that there have been Chinese immigrants here for 200 years is, is upsetting to me in, in a very deep and profound way. So, but I think time is the longest thing because it took time and we accepted um, Italian immigrants. It took time and we accepted Jewish immigrants although that is also currently swinging back. So time above anything. And I guess one of the most interesting sort of inspiring conversations that I've had recently um, is with a chef, um, come on, Wilson Tang. There it went, I found it. From um, Nam Wah. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite, yeah, my exactly. buddy Wilson. And he, there for a while, they opened up Fung Tu down on Orchard Street. So I actually did a panel with him and um, Mario Carbone. Yes, they found all the names. I'm not so good with them, okay. And Italian American chef, Chinese American chef. And they created a food that maybe 20 years ago we would have called fusion. Um, they done like three key family specialties. They were pulling ingredients from Chinatown and done it in Nam Wah and Feng Tzu. They were using traditional Chinese techniques, but like making egg rolls with olives and pork belly. So we might call that fusion food. They both said essentially the same thing to me in two different interviews. That's just how we cook because we grew up in New York City. So, in one of the things that to me is beautiful about American culture is that we don't necessarily have that cultural purity of other nations, this line of French sauces that have been made the same way for 2,000 years. That's hyperbole, but you see where I'm going with this. Things do change and evolve in a really inspiring and exciting way. Even Chinese takeout I find really exciting because it's a cuisine that only exists here and is slightly different in every different nation that you go to and it's different from what's back home. That doesn't make it not real. That doesn't make it not food, it makes it American, Chinese American food, something new and awesome and exciting. So the way that food get, comes together and gets repurposed and grows and changes and becomes something entirely different, something American, that I find really, really awesome. But, but yeah. you said something really fascinating to me, which is, you, you, I know what you meant when you said new and awesome and exciting, the yeah. idea that we can appreciate it. And I also know you know that it's actually old, awesome, and exciting, right? Because Chinese American food is 130, 140 years old yeah. in this country yeah. and it's its own unique thing, much in the same way that Italian American food is its own unique, unique thing. thing. And most people are usually surprised to understand that spaghetti and meatballs and marinara sauce does not exist in Italy. Mario they, also talks about how Italians come into his restaurant and hate the food <laughs> because it's not Italian. Real it's not, Ita Italian it's Italians. Not, yeah, but we use that word real, right? It's yes. not real Italian food. No, it's Italian American food. And that has become something all of its own. And also, by the way, has stuck around because the Italians were really stubborn. Um, there was a 40% repatriation rate amongst Italian immigrants. That meant almost half of all Italian immigrants here went back to Italy. They did not stay. 
And if you don't want to stay here, you have no interest in assimilating to American food or culture. So the reason we have such strong sort of Italian pride and food ways here is because the Italians were stubborn and didn't want to Americanize. Right, so the next time you criticize someone, not you personally, the next time you hear someone criticize an immigrant group for not Americanizing, not speaking English, not doing this, that, or the other, think about Italian culture and the fact that if you can sort of persevere through that prejudice and be stubborn, you create something really new and we, we are rewarded from that. We have been rewarded for every single immigrant group that we've let into this country. We've become richer, we have changed, we have, I mean, even the Christmas tree that some of you are gonna put up in December, that wasn't our idea, those were German immigrants. Even the lager beer that you might have at the end of this day, our culture is so German, but it happened so long ago, we won't even recognize it. So maybe in 150 years, people will laugh at the idea that we had to have an umami world forum to convince people that tasting savory things was not gonna hurt you. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question directly, Andrew. It's more of a collection of thoughts. I just wanted to hear, yes, You it just did. want me to hear me keep talking? I just, yeah, I'm selfish. <laughs> thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you everybody for your time. I sincerely appreciate your attention, and if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to come chat. Thank you. Yeah.